Welcome to this brief video introduction with the title Inquiry Learning in Science Domains. My name is Ton de Jong. I'm from the University of Twente in the Netherlands from the Department of Instructional Technology. In this video introduction, I will present a few basic issues on inquiry learning, the technologies that we can use to foster inquiry learning, the problems that students experience and how we can resolve those. I will also briefly indicate a project that we currently do have, the GoLab project, in which learning, inquiry learning with online labs is the central theme. Well, first of all, let us think why inquiry learning should be important or could be important. What we do see is that uh, there is a large need for new science instruction. We need science instruction that is engaging for students because what we now see is that students approach science on a very superficial way. They learn procedures instead of learning the deep level knowledge and they are not motivated to do science and also not motivated to, do, to, make, uh, to choose a career in science later on. In these two reports that you see on the slide here, one of them is the Roca report, very influential reports. This is very well indicated and there is a cry for new approaches in science instruction of which inquiry learning is one. Now, what is the central point of inquiry learning? What is the central point of reformations in science learning? Well, in this slide, what you do see in the center, what we start with, is the knowledge of the students. That is what they want to learn. That is what they have to acquire in the end. And our view on what is valuable knowledge has changed over the years. Nowadays, we see valuable knowledge as something that is very tied to the individual. A student can give his or her own flavor to the knowledge that they do acquire. There is not one universal truth. Of course, there are general laws, but students can flavor them in their own way. The second characteristic of knowledge that we started to value is that knowledge is more social, which seems in contradiction with the individual, but that's not the case. The social aspect of knowledge means that we see that knowledge should be shared between people that as a learner, as a knowledge owner, you should be able to share your knowledge with others so you can explain it and you can also understand information that others tell you. The third characteristic of knowledge that we started to value is that knowledge should be more contextual. Instead of being abstract, we see that knowledge should function in real context and it should be, you should be able to apply that knowledge in real life in real life, in, in, in problems that you see in your companies, for example. But these three characteristics together are related to different forms of instruction. And you see that on the next slide. What you do see here is that um, inquiry, inquiry, uh, uh, inquiry learning is related to individual, the individual aspect of knowledge, um, the collaborative learning with the social aspect of, uh, of knowledge, and learning in real context, situational uh, learning, is related to the contextual aspect. So we have three forms of learning that are related with three new forms of three sorry that are related to characteristics of knowledge that we started to value nowadays. Now, if we move to how we can realize those new forms of learning, what you see here is the three forms of learning the constructive inquiry learning, the collaborative learning, and the situated learning. And we have technologies that can help us to realize each of them. For constructive learning, we have computer simulations and games where students have to manipulate a model and can do their own experimentation. We have modeling or design environments where students, instead of manipulating a model, create their own model. There's collaborative learning where we have shared objects, objects that students can share on a distance and that they work, can work on together. And we have all kinds of communication patterns supported by chats and video conferencing. And for situated learning, we have techniques to bring reality into the classroom. For example, online laboratories that mimic a real laboratory can be used to have students in experience as if they were in a real laboratory. Let me give you two examples of 
that kind of technologies. And in this presentation, we focus on the constructive inquiry part and on the computer simulations and the online laboratories. Often, these are combined with situated and collaborative learning, but the focus now is on the constructive and inquiry learning. Here you see four screenshots of a larger uh, environment, a larger project that we do have that is called SimQuest, where we have about 30, 40 simulation-based learning environments spread around the world, translated in many languages. And here you see four examples. For example, on the left upper corner, you see a simulation of a crane. Uh, it's about momentum, you can change as a learner, the length of the arm, the forces, etc. And you see that manipulated, you see that changed in a number of different representations in the crane itself, in a table that's going with it, in a graph, and in a formula. So that all goes together. Um, another example from a very different domain that is from psychology, is a simulation that we have made, and we have now about 70 of those simulations sold worldwide, where you can play Pavlov. You are part, you are Pavlov in his laboratory, and you have a dog, a virtual dog, and you can give the dog a sausage. Um, you can, you see that if you give the, dosage, the dog a sausage, that it will start to salivate. Um, you can uh, put on the light, you'll see some conditioning going on, you can do, uh, uh, put on the bell, uh, you have second order conditioning, you can do extinction, but basically it's like within science, you have in psychology also laboratories where as a student you can really experience the laboratory as it is in the real world. So we do have inquiry learning and we do have a number of uh, technological environments that help to realize them. But then the question is, why would uh, uh, inquiry work? Why should inquiry work? What are the theoretical foundations between, behind inquiry learning? Well, first of all, in inquiry learning, normally students follow a scientific investigation cycle, which means that you, after an orientation, you have to set up hypotheses, you do experiments, you get data, you have to make interpretations of data, Sometimes you have a hypothesis that is not uh, supported by the data, so you have to change your ID. So this is really knowledge generating activities. Another way that inquiry works, inquiry with technology-based learning environments, is uh, that often multiple representations are used. Like in the example that I showed about a crane, where you have formula, an interactive formula, you have graphs, you have tables, you have the real representation, all that, that, that varies together. And as a learner, you have to make abstractions over those representations. And that helps you to make, to really get the gist of the domain, to really learn what is going on, because you have to make abstractions over concrete representations. And the final um, uh, phenomenon that we know of in psychology is what is called the generation effect. And the generation effect means that if you learn something by generating the information yourself, that is much better remembered and much better understood than when it is being presented to you. Well, what happens if you do inquiry learning with a simulation? The model that is behind the simulation, behind the interface, is hidden for you, and you have to find it out yourself how the, 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 the rules behind the model function. So you have to generate that knowledge yourself. Well, this is the good part of the story. Um, the bad part, or the other side of the, of the coin, is that there are some problems with inquiry learning. Students don't find it a very easy process. They find it a difficult process. And students, one of the, one of the issues is that students don't know how to perform inquiry processes. For example, they don't know how to state a hypothesis. That means they don't know how to state a testable sentence, a testable hypothesis. Um, they create poor experiments where they change too many variables at the same time. They do not monitor what they have been doing, so they get lost while they are in their inquiry process. And there's poor planning, and there's many other things that go wrong when students go into inquiry learning. If you just give them a simulation or an online lab as it is. Remember, it's the student who is in the driver's seat who has to do the things, who has to discover the domain, and that is not easy for students to do. So here we are, we have 
a, a way of learning that we think could be very productive because we have theoretical underpinnings for that. We have technolo technological environments that help students to, uh, to, uh, to do that type of learning. Uh, but there are some problems with the, uh, with the processes. Luckily, we have ways to support that. And that is what we call guidance. And here you see a number of ways how we can support students while they do inquiry learning. For example, we give them process constraints, which means that we start with a very simple environment and gradually increase the complexity. We can give them prompts or assignments instead of thinking what they have to find out themselves. You give them an assignment on exactly what to find out. We can give them heuristics, for example, how to design a good experiment. We can give them scaffolds, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And we can give them background information. So if they don't find the information themselves on a specific point, we can give them extra information. Well, I did not, I said I would come back to the scaffolds. And scaffolds basically are one of the main ways to give guidance to students. And scaffolds are small tools that help you to perform specific learning processes. So, for example, we can give students a hypothesis scratchpad that helps them to create a hypothesis from terms and relations that we provide them with. We can give them an experiment design tool that helps them to design um, well-designed experiments. We can give tools that help them to make interpretations of data or tools that help them to store and redo all their experiments so that they have a good monitoring of what they have been doing, and many more examples. Let me give you a concrete example of what is a scaffold. Well, here you see a, a, a screen of a virtual laboratory that we created about buoyancy, floating and sinking of objects. And students can change here the density of the fluid, the density of the object, and they can change the mass and the volume, of course, that will change the density. And they can do their experiments. It's not easy to design good experiments here. So what we designed for students to give them is what we call an experiment design scaffold or an experiment design tool. Here you see the interface of that. Students are provided with a number of uh, objects, a number of variables that they can drag to a box where they can say, I want to change the values of these, this variable. And of other uh, variables, they can say, I want to keep that the same over a set of runs in my experiment. And these are the variables that I do like to observe. What the tool does is that if you change two, uh, two variables at the same time, it will give you a hint and it will tell you, well, maybe it's not smart to change two variables at the same time. Maybe you should place it in another box. And in this way, it helps you to create well-designed uh, experiments. And we have many more examples of those types of scaffolds. Okay, so, so now we know that students can be supported by giving them guidance and giving them scaffolds, for example. The question is, does this help the students to acquire better results? If we compare well-designed, so that means guidance included, inquiry-based learning with online labs and uh, simulations, and if we compare that to expository instruction, we see that learning with these virtual environments uh, shows an advantage over that direct instruction. So students learn more that if they use uh, inquiry learning. And this is shown in a number of studies in many domains and also in meta-analysis. We can also make another comparison. We can compare learning with online laboratories with the real laboratory, so still inquiry involved. And of course, in a real laboratory, you will learn many skills that you don't learn in a virtual environment. For example, you learn how to operate equipment and you learn safety procedures. But if we focus on conceptual knowledge, then we see that if we give a virtual online lab and we compare that with learning in a real online lab, that students gain at least the same level of knowledge and often they acquire better knowledge than learning in a real laboratory. So from that perspective, it is to be preferred to use online laboratories instead of the real ones. So in summary, compared to direct instruction and to online laboratories, inquiry learning, virtual learning environments, simulations and online labs work better in general. Well, finally, I'd like to present you three slides of a project that's currently ongoing, and that is the GoLab project. Here you do see the, um, uh, the logo of the project. What is the goal of the GoLab project, which is now in its 
uh, right after its first year of existence. What we'd like to offer in Golab is summarized in this one slide, which is a very brief summary of such a large project. What we'd like to offer to teachers is a federation of online labs. We'd like to offer a portal where teachers can go, where they can find many online labs, but where they can also find scaffolds, complete learning environments, so with guidance included, and they can use and adapt that to their needs. So what we do is that we embed those online labs that are around in the world, and we embed them in instructional guidance, and this is available for teachers to use as it is, or to uh, make adaptations. And in this way, we'd like to create a community of users, of teachers and learners who share information, who share um, uh, uh, learning spaces that they have created, who share online laboratories, so that we have a worldwide community of virtual learning, of learning with virtual online laboratories. Now, for the future, what, do, what are the main developments in the future? Well, there are a few things that we think we can do now. One of the things is that we have, if you learn in a online laboratory or in a simulation, if you do inquiry learning, we have many data from you. We have information from your log files, so all the actions that you do. If it's collaborative, we have information about the chats that you, uh, that you are doing with your fellow students. And we have the products that you design. So if you create a model, if you create a concept map while you are in the inquiry process, we have that at our disposal. And we can do make analysis of that. And we can use that information to adapt the information, to adapt the guidance to you, to, for example, present you a scaffold just in time when you need it. So that is a line of research that we are currently following. And finally, we now know that inquiry can be more effective than direct instruction or learning in a real lab. We know that guidance is needed. And now the next step is to make that whole process more efficient, to not only find for the effective ways of supporting students, but also to look for the more efficient ones. Well, this was the brief introduction to inquiry learning with simulations and online laboratories. Uh, in summary, we have seen that there are many, many opportunities for including online laboratories uh, and simulations in the classroom. On many topics, not only in science, but as you have seen in the example, also on psychology. We have also seen that there are real advantages to the inquiry learning processes, uh, theoretical advantages that show that students can learn but that students also have problems and that there are ways to help students to prevent or overcome this, those problems and that really leads to a highly productive learning environment. Thank you very much.